In Kathmandu, Nepal's capital, these workers earn just two dollars a day. But that's a good wage in a country where the average is just one dollar. In April, they earn nothing as Maoist guerrillas besiege the city, demanding a general strike. Work is now slowly picking up again. Nowadays, the situation in Nepal is good. We have work and I earn money for food and my family. Nepal has a population of around 25 million, but a national budget about the same size as an average European town. Together with rampant corruption and bureaucratic waste, this means it's nigh on impossible to provide the rapidly growing population of Kathmandu with work, housing and electricity. Old leaky pipes mean most people in the suburbs frequently suffer water shortages. We need to stand in line and we get water in the morning around 8.30, in the evening around 5 because there are too many people in town. What costs money is security. Army, paramilitary troops and police are on constant alert against possible attacks from Maoist rebels. These guerrillas are able to hit targets even inside Kathmandu. Last fall, the police station in Sanku came under a coordinated Suddenly, attack. They shot down the sentry out here in the gate and they directly intervened in the post. And with the firefighting and with blasting, they have immediately captured they took over, they ran over the post and they, they have captured all the weapons and within a few minutes they flew away. The inability to root out the Maoists was claimed as a major reason for the dismissal of Parliament by King Gyanandra on February the 1st. He imposed a state of emergency and seized power himself. Hundreds of politicians, journalists and student leaders were jailed or put under house arrest and the king launched an offensive against the guerrillas. It is here in the mountains of western Nepal that the Maoists have their stronghold. The area is well suited to guerrilla warfare. It's mountainous and covered with thick forests and the unarmed population can hardly resist any demands put on them by the rebels. <laughs> They come in the villages for donations or if they need to proclaim a strike. They will come two, three days before it for donations or to proclaim a strike or to strengthen their organization. Keshiv owns a few cows, a few goats and a little land. The village of Dharmagan is not far from where the Maoists started their uprising, but it is poor and is largely unable to support the rebels except by providing rice to eat. Nonetheless, they continue to come here almost once a week. The army comes just as often. My situation is, God knows. I'm only a man. We help each other in my village and support neither Maoists nor army. There are checkpoints all over Nepal where vehicles and their passengers are controlled by the army. Every vehicle number is written down. Since the Maoist uprising against the government and king began in 1996, more than 11,000 Nepalis have been killed, mostly civilians caught up in the crossfire between rebels and army. Last year, 2,500 were killed, making the conflict in Nepal Asia's second most deadly conflict after Iraq. The army and blue uniformed paramilitary control the cities and major roads. The Maoists, the countryside. The rebels commonly recruit men by force and civilians are exposed to terror and intimidation if they don't protect and support the Maoists. They came in our village and asked for some food and some money and threatened us with explosions. Until now, if the king had not taken over the government, maybe the Maoists had forced us to go with them. Yes, if the king hadn't taken over power, they would have done that. When the Maoists are in my village during the time the army doesn't come here, and when the army comes into the village, the Maoists run away. They are both trying to avoid each other. What do they meet? Then there's a war. If there is a war between the Maoists and the army and we are in between, definitely we will die.
The population is the hardest hit in a war between two parties which neither is strong enough to win. But now, after the royal takeover, the army claims to have the upper hand and that peace negotiations will be meaningless. They used the peace talks to re-strengthen themselves and they thought that they were very powerful. They were that gone grown stronger. But once we started uh, chasing them and once we started uh, attacking them, their power have started degrading. So they're not as strong as they were in 2003. The result of the war is that almost half a million Nepalis have been turned into refugees. Close to 500 are in this camp in Nepal's southwestern lowlands. In the oppressive heat, in makeshift houses with scarcely any food or water, it is mostly women and children eking out their days here. Most of them were driven from their villages after the women staged a protest against the rebels. <laughs> We are all from the same district here because of the same reason. Some people came because the Maoists blasted their homes and some were forced out of the village. The refugees have started a primitive school for the children. Most men have continued south to neighbouring India in search of work. It is estimated close to 700,000 Nepalis have fled across the border. The army couldn't protect them in their villages, and here they don't receive any support from the government either. We are war refugees. Sometimes the Maoists come to maltreat us, and sometimes the army. We are not here only because of the Maoists, because of the government also. Hundreds of thousands of people have already left the country uh, to, uh, to neighboring India. So there's a complete chaos and confusion and the absolute absence of the rule of the law. Him Rights works to protect human rights and documents crimes committed in the countryside. Among other things, they have a 24-hour telephone line. According to the UN and other international organizations, Nepal's military has one of the world's worst human rights records, even before the royal takeover. Uh, it's not only a case or two or a dozen cases. There are hundreds of uh, cases in which innocent civilians have been killed, innocent civil civilians have been uh, disappeared, they have been inflicted torture, but compensation, together with uh, you know, addressing the problem of impunity, are bringing the perpetrators to justice, there has been a nominal exercise. I'll say, I, I'll, I can say only one thing, that they're totally wrong. Uh, we are not acting with impunity. We have punished our people. More than 40 cases have been tried. I mean, um, people have been uh, sentenced to jail, they have been given jail sentences, they have been, uh, they have been discharged from the army. Even up to rank of colonel have been detained. We are taking action against them. So what happens is mainly human rights people, they don't, I mean, they, don't, they should stay for a longer period to find out what's happening actually. In Nepal, there has always been friction between different ethnic groups and between city and countryside. This village is poor and we are farmers. Some people are rich and they give their land to poor people for farming. The Maoists received the majority of their support because of their promise to redistribute land and abolish the deep-rooted caste system. Karun caste is the first position in this village. First are the Karungs, and then the Brahouns, and the Magars, and the Kamis, and the Gurits. And then the Chastris. But the village's first priority are for the Karungs and the Brahouns. People here don't trust politicians, believing them all corrupt. 
The king, on the other hand, traditionally receives strong support. Polish government not so good. Polish Polish government last time do not good work of people. He thinking only how to uh, collection money. Long ago, the king ruled the country and there was peace. He will make peace again. In 1990, power was ceded from the then King Barendra to an elected government and a brief experiment with democracy started. But democracy faltered due to party infighting and corruption among the political parties. The king, too, maintained a dominant role. The society would have slowly uh, elected more clean and more competent people. But that would definitely take some time. But before that, the democracy was blamed for all the corruption and everything. And certain quarter of the country, of the, of the uh, you know, power blocks, they are trying to root out democracy from the country. At the newspaper Kathmandu Post, journalists eagerly wait the lifting of reporting restrictions. There is still a ban against criticizing the monarchy and political debate is stifled. Out in the streets of Kathmandu, police and paramilitaries wait. Even though the martial law was lifted on May the 1st, demonstrations against the king's regime are growing. It's very difficult for the political parties to even to come out, uh, but still there are certain movements going on in the, in the street. Uh, people are coming out, they are uh, demanding uh, full democracy. Many politicians are still in jail and independent observers are prevented from working. Uh, there is a direct threat to uh, some of the uh, leading human rights defenders and in other ways there is a perceived threat. There is intimidation, there is a kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the terror which is reigning the uh, entire nation. Uh, because of the uh, rapid militarization of uh, all organs of the state. In late April, the Communist Party headquarters in Kathmandu was attacked. At 2020, in between, uh, security men attacked our office at 4 local time, evening. And first of all, they tried to crack down this one. This is our main door, main entrance. The attackers wore masks and kicked in doors, and a few party members were arrested. But politicians are also threatened by the Maoist rebels. They made a death warrant threat against me. It was last year. When they came to kidnap me and my son at my house, that time the people, the people gathered and uh, killed the Maoist kidnappers. The royal takeover was motivated by the war against the rebels. The Communist Party, more like a social democrat party and the biggest party in Nepal, wants peace negotiations. But that has been dismissed out of hand by the heavily military dominated monarchy. It is more or less a, a military state. Everywhere uh, the ruling chief is uh, army general. And the civil uh, administration is only for a sopis. The children's mock parliament is also a struggle for democracy, for the children. During three days in late April, 85 young delegates discussed children's rights in the war-torn country. The event was organized by human rights organizations. The, the mock child parliament is a platform for children to really bring out their issues, to really exercise their right to speak about what issues they have. So this is really a place where they can really bring out their issues and hopefully we can take this to the policy makers. As elsewhere, children are the worst affected by the war. This and other questions were discussed for the second year in a row. Children are the future and prison too. So I think politicians must listen to our voice. The politicians should listen to our views because if the children take a chance to create their future, then this is good for the development of the country.
As long as the countryside is underdeveloped and poor, the Maoists will receive support and the rural regime has so far shown no interest in peace negotiations. Peace seems far away in Nepal, a country much dependent on foreign aid. They don't like to call the Maoists in a dialogue. They simply they, they think that we have to suppress, we have to kill everyone. So we, we are requesting the whole world do not support the, the uh, do not uh, support to strengthen the army of Nepal. It's about the people ruling the country. If both the parties are serious about the welfare of the general public and general people, there should be always be the people ruling the country. That means the political parties. So I believe the, uh, the donor communities, they can put pressure on the government, especially on the government, to take along the political parties to resolve the Maoist problem. Yes, he is very worried. He is very worried. His blood pressure is elevated uh, a lot of times, and uh, I am uh, very worried about him not to get a stroke or something like that from the weariness that uh, uh, the, our house might bomb uh, by any second. Yeah. Because there is a lot of civil. Yeah. Because there is a lot of civil buildings are uh, distracted or nearby. We don't know that uh, Saddam is hiding these weapons again, uh, among our houses and uh, nearby. So we are afraid that one of these houses might uh, be nearby our house. Yeah. And he also, yeah, sorry. And he also, Saddam also walk between among our uh, neighborhood because it's safe, so he's holding meetings, uh, you know, in civil areas. So we, we can get bombed by, yeah, by who, by, uh, by accident, yes. Yeah. I think he's outside Iraq. Because if he inside Iraq, if he inside Iraq, he might get some help by, by him, by his, uh, by his, uh, you know, uh, men or uh, army. But uh, there is nothing, nothing happened, and he can he can manage to bomb something or doing something to these uh, parties or anyone against him. But he didn't manage to, to do such a thing, so he is not here. Or the Americans might know where he is here, where he is. And they didn't tell us because they don't need, they don't, they want always, they want Saddam as a mystery, to, to be a mystery.